The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Last time we talked about Hund's cases uh, and used as an example a double pi state and a doublet sigma plus state. And uh, I tried to give a sense of the different uh, limits uh, in terms of delta E pi sigma, um, spin orbit, and uh, B uh, y, y is j plus a half. Um, the relative sizes of these three terms determine which Huns case one is in. And uh, um, in a limiting Huns case, there's always a pattern forming rotational quantum number. And that means that the energy, rotational energy levels can be arranged as B times either an integer or a half integer times that self. That, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, B N N plus 1 or B J J plus 1. And this is very useful in terms of thinking about the energy level structure you're going to see in the spectrum. And the examples I talked about, because I, I needed to include interactions between states as well as a state that had uh, fine structure, I chose the simplest possible case where you have two electronic states and uh, this can generate each, uh, examples of each of the Huns cases. So I was talking about systematic effects uh, involving two states and today we're going to talk about uh, accidental effects between different electronic states. These accidental degeneracies result in peculiar anomalies in the spectra, and they're called perturbations. And it just happens that in my scientific development, this is where everything really started. As a graduate student, I had a problem uh, that uh, uh, I agreed to work on um, in the Klemper group, and that was to measure the Stark effect in the CO A single pi state. So the goal was to measure the electric dipole moment. Uh, and that was a hard thing because this has a, uh, these uh, levels have a lifetime of 10 to the minus 8 seconds. And uh, so, it, and we didn't have lasers. And so I realized that in order to do this, I needed to be able to make some predictions of what frequency to use to look for the transition that I would then apply the electric field to and measure the Stark effect. And, and so what I ended up doing is collecting all known and some unknown perturbations in the, involving the singlet pi and triplet pi states of CO. And I fitted all of those perturbations to a model because I had a goal of being able to make some predictions. And so instead of starting with the usual Hertzbergian approach to spectra, which was to uh, look at spectra and reduce them to the kinds of things that you put in tables like rotational constants and vibrational constants and maybe spin orbit constants, the regular aspects of the spectra. I was focusing on the rebellious aspects of the spectra. Now, there were two schools of classical spectroscopy at that time, the Hertzbergian school, which tended to uh, devalue or exclude from spectra these perturbations because they're very different one from another. There's no natural way of tabulating them. There's no simple theory of what, what they're for. 
And then there were others who uh, uh, dealt with the spectroscopic complexity because that was a challenge and they handled the spectroscopic perturbations. And so I became a collector of perturbations. And this led to a fascination with broken patterns and with what are the unconventional ways of learning about molecular dynamics. So it's, a, it's an inter to me, it's a, it, it's a special story because I really took stuff from people's wastebaskets. You know, the perturbations were, you know, not considered to be important. And I focused on these wastebasket items and I built my career on it. Okay, so let's give a... Uh, the other school of spectroscopy have a name? Well, there was Hertzbergian and uh, uh, the, the, the main exponents of that other school were Richard Barrow and Elbin Lagerqvist. And they were very good friends and worked together often. Another story is that they collaborated uh, on analyzing the perturbations in the spectrum of CS, which was my first successful piece of work uh, uh, based on their analysis. And uh, I always ref thought of that CS work as Lagerkvist. And, you know, because the paper was Lagerkvist, Linden, Barrow. And uh, uh, one time when I had become a really good friend of Richard Barrow, I kept referring to the CS work as Lagerkvist's work. And uh, I, I realized what I was doing, to, you know, as the words came out of my mouth. But uh, uh, anyway, let's, let's uh, get back, not to the history of science or my history, but to these interesting things. So we go from systematic effects to accidents. These accidents occur when two electronic states, which don't know anything about each other, or we don't think they know anything about each other, accidentally uh, become degenerate because they have different rotational constants. So we have a situation where if we plot energy versus JJ plus one, we get something like this, where we have two different states and because they have different rotational constants, at some point they will cross. And uh, sometimes that difference in rotational constant or the range of J that you are able to sample is so large that we might have, uh, uh, why do I call, oh, main, okay. There's a, a language associated with perturbations, main and extra. You know, this is also uh, psychologically loaded, the main state and the extra state. You know, it's not really supposed to be there, but it's, it, it crowds its way in. So this is V main, V main plus one. Two different vibrational levels, and this is V perturber. And because the rotational constant is, is large, we have intersections that occur of two successive vibrational levels. And there's another little technical thing. This intersection is called the culmination of a perturbation, and you'll see why. And so we would have for... So if one were looking at uh, uh, the spectra of this main state, the bright state, well, there'll be some kind of thing that occurs in the spectrum at low J, and in the next vibrational level, there might be some kind of thing that occurs at higher J, and there might be another level that comes through. And so one begins to see the states that you're not allowed to see because of selection rules through their disruptions of the state that you observe. And so one tries to build a big story around a little bit of information that occurs near the localization. The, 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 the crossing. Now, terminology, bright and dark. This is a very important terminology in physical chemistry, and it's, it's, it's more complicated 
than it might seem. You know, you say something is bright or dark, that, you know, you're talking about a color or illumination, and it's a sort of an absolute terminology. Brightness has to do with how one observes the spectrum. And so, suppose our main state is a state that has an allowed transition from the ground state. And the perturber, or the dark state, doesn't. So that means that uh, you're allowed to see levels like this, but you're not supposed to be able to see these levels. That makes them dark. But suppose you're doing a different kind of experiment where you're exciting from this level up to some higher state, and uh, the higher state you're using has allowed transitions from this and not that. And so the, the role of brightness or the, the ca characteristic of brightness can apply to different, uh, can be applied in opposite senses depending on what the, is the nature of the experiment. And this is an extremely important concept, especially in vibrational dynamics of polyatomic molecules because there are so many different kinds of experiments where you can choose what's bright and what's dark. And one of the, the things that makes Brooks Pate such a special scientist is that he has invented different ways of making things bright. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's something that makes a detailed study of almost everything Brooks has done uh, of particular value. And he would probably say the same thing about me because stimulated emission pumping made certain classes of vibrational levels bright and accessible. And up until that, the, when I invented stimulated emission pumping, only high overtones of the highest frequency modes were bright. And so this provided completely different complementary views of molecular dynamics. So we have bright and dark. But now you can see that if your observation of a class of states is dependent on accidents of near degeneracy, you're not going to have a very systematic picture of the dark states. You're going to get whatever nature allows you to uh, uh, get a glimpse of. And, but if you have a, an overall picture of how things work, one can leverage little bits into a lot. Okay, but now, uh, the, the main point I want to talk about is what do the spectra look like at perturbations? Because you start with uh, a, you start with the spectrum and how do you, if a pattern is broken, what do you do? Because so much of assigning spectra is based on recognizing a pattern and then exploiting that. And there are many, many traditional ways of recognizing patterns. The best is the use of combination differences, where you have transitions linked this way or this way, where you, in this case, you know two energy levels here, and whenever that energy difference appears, uh, in the spectrum, you have located a level uh, upstairs uniquely, regardless of whether the upstairs levels have, are perturbed. And uh, similarly here, uh, uh, if you have two transitions out of a given level downstairs, uh, um, you, uh, what you want to know is, are they out of a given level? Um, and uh, there, there might be combination differences here, but these combination differences, they might be repeated in different bands, but uh, they don't follow the usual pattern. So these kinds of combination differences are often difficult to see, and these are always observable. Okay, so when we have an avoided crossing like this, or when we have a level crossing like this, uh, that's a special example of Born-Oppenheimer breakdown. And when you have a Born-Oppenheimer breakdown, you expect an avoided crossing. 
Now, there are several kinds of avoided crossings and people get confused. You can have potential curves not crossing because they belong to the same symmetry and as a result, there has to be uh, an off-diagonal matrix elements between the electronic potentials, uh, the electronic states. And so you get potential curves uh, avoiding each other. But here, we're talking about vibrational term curves avoiding each other. The actual energy levels uh, uh, avoid each other. And that's what we're, we're going to be looking at. At an avoided crossing, you get level repulsion. And you get mixing so that the eigenstates are of mixed character. Uh, and that means that the intensities are going to be messed up. The level repulsion means that the frequencies are going to be messed up. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes because of the intensities being messed up, you get what are called extra lines lines belonging to the dark state, nominally the dark state. But uh, um, and so uh, it's very puzzling when you look at a spectrum and you analyze it and you have two R7 branches, two R7 lines. And that, should, that bothers some people, but for me it's great because that means I've, I've actually sampled something of the dark state. Um, there's terminology called intensity borrowing. This is a low interest loan that will never be repaid. <laughs> the, the borrowing is for keeps. And all of this is called a perturbation. And there are often interference effects. And so and the standard stuff of perturbations is here. Interference effects is an extra dividend that can provide information about the signs of certain quantities that you normally wouldn't uh, be able to determine experimentally. So, so perturbations occur when two states become near degenerate. And when that happens, the actual energy levels do this. The, you follow a smooth series of energy levels, discreetly sampled. So it's not a smooth series. I mean, you, you know, you're sampling discrete points on these curves. And usually, uh, your, your sense of pattern recognition is such that you, can, you, you see that the uh, energy levels on this curve somehow fall into a natural sequence. And there's another natural sequence of energy levels over here. And so uh, one tends to uh, uh, arrange the, the data that you obtain from an analysis of the spectra into these tracks. And sometimes you have two tracks. And if, uh, if we say this is the dark state, well then what's going to happen is that uh, the, the track that starts with the bright state starts at the lowest J. And then you follow this one and you're, you found yourself on the, on the dark state and it peters out. It disappears. Whereas this track, which uh, is associated with the dark state here, it starts out at zero intensity, it gets some intensity, and then you've magically found yourself onto the bright state and it continues forever. So you have these two sections of spectra that look a little strange, uh, and, and that uh, is a sign of a perturbation. Now, what we want to do is to understand uh, what does the spectrum look like and how do we uh, uh, gain a foothold on it. Uh, I guess I should, uh, I'll go over to the other board. And I have to be really careful, careful about that because on page three of the notes, there is uh, a, a diagram of how the spectrum is affected, which is wrong. 
and it's wrong in a, uh, a qualitative sense, and I have to uh, explain it better. So let's begin with, suppose we have a state, uh, a bright state, of the usual flavor where B prime is less than B double prime. It's usually true that the excited state is less bound than the uh, ground state, and this means we will have what's called a red degraded band. And the head is in the R branch. So uh, you have a P branch that always starts out going to the red, and you have an R branch that starts out going to the blue, and it turns around and then goes to the red. And so, and that's one of the, the beautiful things about electronic transitions. You have these band heads and it makes life complicated. In addition, the spectrum is not an energy level diagram. It's a difference in two, of two energy level diagrams. So the lines in uh, the spectrum are, might be very close together much closer together than the actual levels are. And so if the levels are shifted, this will have a profound effect on the appearance of the spectrum. And so you get some really counterintuitive things. So let us now say that we have a dark state where, so let's call this the main state, uh, where the dark state, let's just call it D, uh, is greater than the main state. And so, and that's what I drew over here. We have the, the main state with a small B value and a dark state with a big B value. And so what happens is the dark state overtakes the bright state from below. And there's uh, level repulsion. And so the levels of the bright state are going to be shifted progressively up from where you expected them to be. And at some point, at lower energy than the bright state or the shifted bright state, there will appear, appear a line that doesn't belong. And as you progress, uh, the, after the level crossing, so after the level crossing, uh, one is following the smooth series of, uh, of lines that were, were bright down here and got shifted up, more and more up. And so these are, this is an illustration of how it gets shifted up because you're actually going on the wrong track. And eventually, because the mixing depends on the energy difference relative to the matrix element, and when the zero order energy difference gets large, the mixing starts to go away. And so you run out of intensity, and you find more intense lines uh, now shifted down relative to your expe the expected location. And uh, as the perturber moves out of the way, they come back to their expected positions. So there is this big shift that progresses towards the culmination, and that's also where the intensity of the main line is equal to the intensity of the extra line. And then the anomaly reverses sign, and you have a big shift, and it then tends to go away. So uh, that's the way the spectrum looks. Now on this diagram that, uh, that I put in the notes, all of the level shifts are of the wrong sign. All of them. I, I don't know how I managed to do that. Uh, I puzzled about that and I thought, is there a simple fix by switching red to blue? But I can't do that because it's a P branch. And so 
uh, you're going to have to be, uh, you're just going to have to deal with this diagram. It's qualitatively correct. What it shows is as you approach the culmination, the level shifts get larger and larger. And uh, uh, at the, the, the culmination, you have this huge uh, uh, level shift and an extra line. And so you get, uh, all right. So that's one thing that, you know, the branch that doesn't have the head is pretty much spread out. And usually the lines appear in numerical order. In other words, uh, as J increases in the, in the lower state, the P branch lines are not necessarily uh, shifted out of order, uh, but sometimes something appears, uh, the extra lines will appear out of order. But in the R branch where you're forming a head, the lines are closer and closer together, and now we have these big level shifts. And what ends up happening is the R branch is shattered and you often get double heads. You get, often get fragments where, where the head has the wrong, uh, you know, instead of being red degraded, it's blue degraded. You, you, because the lines are so close together relative to the level, level shifts, you get these horrible things that occur in the actual spectrum. Okay, so. So now I want to talk about uh, the way we look at the uh, information from perturbations rather than the way we look at the spectrum. But you have to remember that it all starts with the spectrum and the analysis of the spectrum. Since you have always in, with perturbations lower state combination differences that are not perturbed, it's usually possible to assemble this broken pattern upstairs without any ambiguity. But now what do you do when you've got some of these things? Okay, so I want to introduce these railroad tie diagrams which uh, are beautiful summaries of the level structure that you can have for uh, perturbing states and how do you use that, these railroad tie diagrams. These uh, diagrams are, uh, you can find them in Hertzberg and in Kovash. I don't remember whether Hertzberg developed them or Kovash did, but anyway. So suppose we have a singlet sigma plus state and a singlet pi state and there's going to be a perturbation between the singlet pi and singlet sigma plus state. And I'm going to draw this a little differently from what I have in the notes. So the energy levels for the singlet sigma plus state are, so this is J, zero, and I'm not going to do them as JJ plus one, I'm just going to have them equally spaced. One, two, three. And this is positive parity, this is negative parity, this is positive parity, negative parity. This is E, 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 E. Now, for our pi state, you start with J equals one. No J equals zero because J can't be less than the projection quantum number. All right, so you start with J equals zero, uh, one, and you have J equals two, and this is the lambda doubling. It's usually not constant, but there are two different uh, parity components for each j, and usually these two go apart as jj plus one, but that's not important. Okay, so we have one, and let's just arbitrarily uh, label the lower one as positive parity, and then we have this annoying pattern But what we end up finding is that uh, this is F, F, F. These are E, E, E. So we have an E track and an F track. And usually uh, the uh, E track is always above the F or always below. 
There's rarely any crossing between them. Okay, and so now what we, we do is we draw in um, what are the possible, not transitions, but perturbations. So the selection rule for perturbations is delta J equals zero because J squared commutes with the exact Hamiltonian. Uh, plus to minus is forbidden. So that's parity, and that's, uh, um, uh, that is because the parity operator commutes with the exact Hamiltonian. Now, because we have both of these things, e to f is forbidden. And this is the more useful thing, because in the spectrum, especially a spectrum, say, of uh, uh, from a lower sigma state to these two things. This will have P and R branches, and this will have P and R and Q branches, and the Q branches are exclusively sampling the F component, and the P and R are exclusively sampling the E. And now we're going to draw in where the perturbations are, and you'll see how valuable E and F is. And it's much better than parity, even though it's really the same thing. Okay, so because of this selection rule, we're interested in uh, which uh, of these, uh, let me displace these a little bit. I hadn't, okay. Okay, so this is minus parity. This is minus parity, so that uh, is a possible perturbation, and this one cannot, they cannot, cannot interact. Okay, and then let's just displace again, just so that you can see it. Now this is positive parity, and so you can go from here to here, but you can't perturb. If you follow this along, what you find is the singlet sigma state only perturbs this track. And this is the track that you see in R and P branches from a singlet sigma state, and this would be only Q branches. So you have a, a unique pattern of perturbations that tell you, oh yeah, uh, I've got a singlet pi state and it's perturbed by a singlet sigma state. If it were perturbed by a singlet pi state or a singlet delta state, then both parities would be affected. And then there's the question of both, both E and F symmetries would be affected. If the lambda doubling, the omega doubling in the perturber is large or small compared to the, 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 the J values at which the, pulminate, uh, the, the perturbation culminates will also be a little different. So here is a very simple illustration. Let's now go to a more complicated case. And I will result, resort, re, return to the more usual representation of the uh, uh, railroad tie diagrams. And that, so, is that the only case where you could only prefer one track, pi and sigma? If you have a state that has only single parity, then it can pick out only one track. And this is neat because for polyatomic molecules you have k equals zero, they're not doubly degenerate. And so it's a way of telling k equals zero from k equals one. And k equals one tends to have big uh, k doubling, asymmetry doublings. And as a result, the crossings of a k equals one with something else will not necessarily occur in the, uh, uh, at the same J for the E and F symmetry. And so there's some useful stuff uh, and in, the, in diatomic molecules, singlet pi states can have fairly large lambda doublings, but singlet delta states can't. And so again, you, you see that there's, there's information about lambda as well as, uh, uh, yes, okay. Now, so uh, uh, this simple, picture tells you that in the spectrum you will have perturbations in the R and P branches, but not in the Q branch. And that's a sufficient 
uh, evidence to say the per perturber was a single sigma state. Now let's take a more complicated situation. Let's look at a single pi state and a triplet sigma plus state. These diagrams are so useful because it really summarizes everything. And you can also convert them to uh, a more general crossing diagram, and I'm pretty sure that's what Kovacs did. Okay, so the energy levels for a, single, a triplet sigma plus state, they tend to be case B-like because there's no lambda that marks the internuclear axis, and so the spin doesn't know about where it is. And so we, uh, we label in, uh, in case B notation. Okay, so we start with n equals zero, and uh, um, let's put in j. If we have a if we have a singlet if we have a, a triplet state, s is one. J is n plus s. If n is zero and s is one, j can only be one. When we go to j equals, uh, when we go to n equals one, then we can have three states. j equals uh, zero, one, and two. And so for n equals two, we have three states. One, two, three. Okay, now we have to label parity. And uh, the parity for a triplet sigma plus state n equals zero is plus, minus, 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 plus, plus, plus. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, but now, this diagram is, is confusing because we have j of one here, here, and here, and j is conserved. Okay, now let's just draw upstairs for singlet pi. Well, singlet pi starts at j equals 1. And uh, uh, so we have, uh, let's plus minus f e minus plus f e. Okay, so here, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm showing that the parities alternate, but the EF doesn't. Uh, it's not necessarily true that E is higher than F. E can be always lower than F, but they're always going to have the same polarity. Okay, so now we have enough information. I, well, I should also uh, uh, put on the EF labels. Okay, so... Um, This is an F level. This is F E F. F E F. So again, the pattern is always the same. And uh, this is a little counterintuitive because this is plus, and you sort of think, well, E is plus. And, but there's two F's and one E for triplet sigma plus states, and two E's and one F for triplet sigma minus states. So that's a little patch you put into your memory. You can figure it out. It doesn't have to be uh, complicated, but mostly you want to be able to recall these things. Okay, so the thing that's absolutely uh, rigorous is parity. And so let's look to see uh, what can happen. Uh, so let's look at j equals one, and we have a plus parity. So j equals one can be perturbed here. It cannot be perturbed here, and it can be perturbed here. Uh, J equals one minus parity. Well, it can't interact with this, but it can interact with that. So what you end up having is this pattern of the F component of triplet of singlet pi interacting with two components of triplet sigma plus and the E interacting with one. And you bet the same pattern's going to occur here. And so if you're looking, say, at the uh, Q branch of a transition into singlet pi, 
uh, you're looking at the F levels, and those guys are going to be perturbed twice at each J. Uh, you're, uh, twice by a particular vibrational level. So there'll be two uh, perturbations at J's far apart. And in between, in the uh, um, uh, P, or R, P and R branch, there will be a perturbation one. And so that's telling you, okay, a triplet sigma plus state will have a unique pattern of perturbations, which identify it as a triplet, uh, as, as a sigma plus or a sigma minus state, and as a sigma, not a pi or a delta. So uh, you, you get a sense of how these perturbations, although they, they give you just a little bit of information. If before the level crossing, the levels of the bright state are shifted up, the perturber is coming from below. If they're shifted down, the perturber is coming from above. The pattern of how many uh, and what kind of perturbations occur identifies the symmetry of the perturber. There's more. Um, how much time do we have? Not much. Uh, okay, there's some there's some tricks for uh, extracting the information from. A, from a, a perturbation. And these tricks are uh, um, important in the early days when perturbed spectra were analyzed for the first time, there were not computers. And it was next to impossible to deal with simultaneous three-level interaction because you would have to diagonalize a three by three. You could do that, but it's very inconvenient. Uh, and uh, diagonalizing a two by two matrix is not so hard, uh, but it would be nice not to have to think about that. And so suppose you have a, uh, uh, a matrix where, okay, so here's the zero order energy, here's the interaction, and so let's, uh, uh, let's call that A and E0, B, H. So this is the two-level problem. Okay, and uh, so what do you do? Uh, well, to make this into a simple, a simple problem, one takes out the center of gravity. So one, one says, okay, we're going to rewrite this as E bar, E bar, 0, 0, plus uh, uh, d over 2 minus d over 2 h h and so here we have the average energies and those would be the average uh, ter uh, the average band origin plus the average b value times jj plus 1 and this is now the two level problem and you you immediately know the solution to this. The energy levels, E plus minus, are uh, D squared plus V squared square root plus or minus. And so the energy levels, the overall energy levels are E bar plus E plus and E bar minus. Okay, so uh, what am I, what, I'm trying to say profound things in a very short time. Okay, so you can uh, use uh, trace invariance. What is trace invariance? It says that the sum of the diagonal elements is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. And so if you have in your spectrum main and extra lines for a couple of j's, you calculate their average energy 
and you fit them to, to uh, a simple straight line plot, and you get the average rotational constant and the average energy. So graphically, you, you know, if you've been able to make assignments, you can determine uh, E0 bar and B bar. And uh, usually, you know, I mean, if you have a perturbation, uh, usually you have a pretty good idea of the molecular constants for the bright state. So if you know the bright state uh, and you can experimentally measure uh, the average properties, you can calculate crudely the energy and rotational constant for the dark state. But that always requires a few main and extra line pairs. <coughs> and, uh, uh, and so the quality of the information you get from a few is very different from 30 or 40, as you might, you might have, well, even more than that. Okay, and then there's the other thing, and that is that if you have an avoided crossing at the culmination, where you're almost always guaranteed to have a main line and an extra line because they have the same intensity. You, you have levels getting as close as possible and this energy separation is 2H, twice the interaction. So if you have now, every, you, you, graphically, you can determine everything you need. Now, this is another thing. In the old days, in order to make this work, you had to observe several main extra pairs. And the extra lines are always weaker than the main lines, and they're not following a pattern, and so you have to really, they could easily be concealed, and so often one only gets one, and then you can't do this. Now, we have some tools where we can actually measure intensities. Intensities, relative intensities of the main and extra line are just as good as having more than one main line and extra line pair. Sorry, I actually missed why you need more than one. Because you can't get, you can get the average energy at some j, but you can't get, uh, you can't fit a bunch of main extra pairs to get a, 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 an energy at j equals zero and the average b value. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But, but from even just one, you can certainly look at the board of crossing and well, I mean, if there's only one, you don't know you're here. You, you know, you might have been as close to the minimum as possible, but uh, uh, so it's useful to have more than one because sometimes the crossing is not quite at an integer j. Uh, but uh, you certainly have enough information from if there's several main extra pairs to get everything. But now, if we can measure intensities to a part in 10 to the 4, you get everything by looking at one pair of main and extra lines. And this is something they couldn't do a long time ago. Okay, the last thing that I uh, want to at least mention is interference effects. And so there's a, an equation at the top of, uh, in the middle of, uh, on page eight, there's an analysis of what are the intensities of the main and extra lines? And the usual situation is we have a bright state and a dark state. And then the, the theory is simple. If the dark state has some intensity of its own, then uh, if you look at the intensity expression, you find that there's a, uh, uh, a positive term associated with the intensity that it gets from say, the, the, the bright character, and another positive term that, that reflects the intensity that you get from the dark character. And then a cross term, which is written as mu x mu bx. These are signed quantities. And so even though we're talking about a probability, there is a term in the probability expression that can be negative. It can never be larger than the positive terms, and this is an interference effect. And furthermore, 
if you have a parallel type transition and a perpendicular type transition. Parallel would say be singlet sigma, singlet sigma. Perpendicular would be singlet pi, singlet sigma. The, uh, the sign of the transition matrix element, including direction cosine, uh, is opposite for P and R branches for perpendicular transitions. And the same for P and R for parallel transitions. And so one is going to have this interference term have one sign for a P branch and the opposite sign for the R branch. And so you end up getting PR intensity anomalies even though the P and the R branch are sampling the same upper level is because of this. And I've made a lot of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say money, uh, I, I've used interference effects a lot. And since people are always fascinated by quantum mechanical interference, it's a good way to get people's attention even though you don't deserve it. And that's all I have to say about perturbations for now. Okay.